when the worshiper brings his offering to the entrance of the tent of meeting, he is making a journey symbolically into the presence of God in the highest heaven. And he can only go so far in that journey personally. He can only go to the entrance of the tent of meeting. He can't go any farther than that. And he lays his hand on the head of his offering and identifies with his offering. He becomes one with it so that the offering becomes his vicar, his representative. And the offering also bears his sin. His sins are imputed to the animal. And the animal then suffers to the point of death, dying in the place of the worshiper. So the idea, again, is when it comes to the spirituality of the law, the law is his path of ascension. And the worshiper has been obedient to the point of death. He has been obedient to the point of death in order to satisfy the penal sanctions of the law. Now, that's the end of the first stage of his journey into the presence of God stage one, which is suffering, but that's followed by a second stage, which is his exaltation. Now, this, I think, is uh, symbolized by the offering being placed on top of the altar. The altar itself is a miniature replica of the mountain. If you think, for example, of the glory fire spirit coming down onto the summit of Mount Sinai, it, it transforms it into a giant um, altar. And so the, the altar in the outer court is a miniature replica of that. And the fire on top of the altar is a symbolic replica of the glory fire spirit at the summit of the mountain. And just as when Moses entered into that pillar of cloud at the summit of the mountain, he was transformed in a partial glorification, so to speak, when he came down from the mountain, so too when the offering is placed at the summit of the altar in the fire, it is transformed by the, by the fire. It is symbolically glorified. It's smokeified mm -hmm. or, or heavenized. And once it is etherealized by the fire, it, it then ascends into the highest heaven in the form of a pillar of cloud. Now we're speaking symbolically here, right? But, um, Again, the, the worshiper is the one who's making this journey, and he's doing it vicariously through his offering, which has been obedient to the point of death and which has now ascended to the summit of God's holy mountain and is now being transformed by the Spirit so that it ascends into the highest heaven. Now, that's the sacrificial system of worship, particularly the burnt offering, which is appended to the mother promise as a dramatic symbolic pre-enactment of its fulfillment. But what happens symbolically here in the old covenant happens truly with Christ. Christ is the true worshiper, the true sacrifice. He's the true priest. He takes that path of ascension into the highest heaven, which takes him from suffering unto glory. He is obedient to the point of death but he is also raised by the Spirit of God, glorified, transformed by the Spirit of God, and ascends to the highest heaven and sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, there are, I think, many different uh, places in the Old Testament uh, that bear that out, uh, and I pointed at a few of them. Um, for example, Leviticus chapter 9 uh, says that fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. So the fire on the altar was a symbolic replica of the fire of the Lord. First Kings chapter 18 is another example. That's when Elijah called on the name of the Lord and the divine fire fell and consumed the burnt yeah, offering. He's a consuming fire. And our God is a consuming fire, mm -hmm. Exodus 24, 17, right. And that he would appeared as a consuming fire at the summit of Mount Sinai. So the fire at the top of the altar is a symbolic replica of God as a consuming fire. Now, one of the passages I think that makes this really clear, though, and I'll, I'll just point this out in closing, is in the book of Judges, uh, chapter 13, uh, whenever the angel of the Lord appears to uh, the soon-to-be parents of Samson, Manoah and his wife, uh, he instructs Manoah to prepare a burnt offering, and when Manoah does and places it on the altar, uh, Judges 13.20 says that the angel of the Lord went 
uh, on top of the altar, on top of the burnt offering. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord also went up in the flame of the altar. That to me was what really opened my uh, thinking with regard to seeing the ascension offering, which by the way is a better translation of it than burnt offering, from the altar of ascension, a symbolic replica of the mountain of ascension. That to me uh, is what uh, made me start thinking about this is a, uh, the symbolism here is the ascension of Christ. It's that of the ascension of Christ. What Christ did truly is symbolically being dramatically pre-enacted in the sacrificial cultus. Yeah, that's that. That's where it all comes together for me, and 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 to to bring that together is so helpful to to understand again this little, whole scope and sweep of God's plan of of redemption. I mean, I I can't get enough of it. What it does so well, at least for me, is that it illuminates a number of texts that mm-hmm. have meaning of which have remained somewhat elusive to me. Um, not only the significance of the of the burnt sacrifices, and once again the uh, the, 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 the scapegoat narrative that is given in the law and other places where the Passover lamb is sacrificed, all of that is kind of like no brainer stuff uh, with regard to how that, that that gets fulfilled in Christ. The burnt offering thing was always somewhat um, mysterious to me. Uh, and then you begin to think about Pentecost and the, 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 the pouring down of the spirit at Pentecost mm. in the form of a fire. Um, as Christ is ascending into heaven, I mean, uh, it, it, I think that this this kind of motif has been uh, somewhat underdeveloped, and and we have material here that I think that we can, um, in a very responsible and edifying way, be, uh, begin to unpack and to illuminate in terms of the significance of Christ's ascension. I mean, when you think about Ephesians chapter two, we have ascended with Christ and we're seated with Him in the heavenly places. Yeah. Um, that just kind of seals together for me the the, the meaning that uh, Glenn has been unpacking for us here. Mm-hmm. In, in Ephesians 5, 2, where it says that Christ is a sacrifice and a pleasing aroma uh, to God, that pleasing aroma is used of the burnt offering, of the grain offering, and of the peace offering in Leviticus chapters 1 through 3, but of no other offerings in the Old Testament as far as I know. Yeah. Well, um, given the time, you know, we're certainly not going to be able to to work through and develop um, much of the Romans 7 material. We can do that in a future episode, but I would at least like to, to uh, list some of the main salient features and points to get us thinking and try to connect it to, this, to the idea of the law's function in the sacrificial system. Because having these two together demonstrates the, the ultimate plan and purpose of what God was doing all along when we understand the sacrificial system as a dramatic pre-enactment of what Christ would do as the true obedient one who ascends uh, the hill of the Lord and then brings us with him. So the theme of our conference, of course, is the law is spiritual. That's a phrase from Romans seven fourteen, which has been perplexing, to say the least, to many interpreters. Uh, you can see I've got uh, some resources over here on the video. You can see uh, John Murray's commentary on Romans. And then uh, the book Resurrection and Eschatology, which is uh, a festschrift, uh, essays in honor of Richard B. Gaffin Jr., which is uh, co-edited by Lane Tipton and Jeff Waddington, two of our colleagues. And so, uh, those are those are two helpful books on this subject. Murray, of course, is is masterful in his exegesis. I disagree with him on his exegesis there. So, what does that say for me? Um, but um, Dennis Johnson in the other book also advocates uh, and, and presents some compelling arguments for what is more traditionally known as a, as a redemptive historical view of what Paul is speaking of in Romans 7. But beyond that, the question is, what does it mean for Paul to say that the law is spiritual? Because elsewhere, it seems that law and spirit are contrasted, that they're antithetical to some people. And so to say that the law is spiritual is rather perplexing, uh, shocking, um, difficult to understand. So just again, a few minutes here, uh, we can't develop a a big giant case, but I do want to sketch out a couple main ideas and encourage people then to watch the, uh, the lectures from the conference. Uh, Jim, um, well, I should say, uh, Glenn's, Glenn's lecture is not yet available online. Decide on what we want to do with that, but you've heard the main thesis of it. Uh, the other lectures that have been posted or at least will be very soon.
So the main thing we need to understand is that when Paul is speaking um, in Romans 7, he uses a first-person singular pronoun, I, but there's been a debate over what he's referring to. Because the ancient church held the view that Paul was referring to himself when he was an unbeliever, uh, the Augustinian and Reformational tradition typically views him as describing a, a present struggle of the believer battling with indwelling sin in this age. But yet others have advocated for a redemptive historical view that Paul is speaking about life under the Old Covenant. So to you know, in my understanding, then Paul is describing when he says I, he's using a, a literary device or a motif to describe Israel and their experience between Sinai and Pentecost. Well, why do I think that? Well, for some reasons, when I preached Galatians, I uh, started to realize that the themes and the way that Paul develops them parallel what Paul is saying in Romans. And I remember being on my back porch. I don't know if I had a fire going or not, so maybe there was some smoke ascending, Glenn. But regardless, I um, was reading Romans and, and thinking about the sermons I had been preaching, I mean Galatians, and then I flipped over and started to read Romans, namely chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I started to see how how lockstep they seem to be if you understand Galatians in a more redemptive historical view and understand the case he's building in chapter 2, 3, and 4. In, especially in 4 when he talks about the, um, the two mountains, Sinai and, and Zion. And so, in short, I started to see that in many ways, Romans was just an amplified version of what Paul is already saying in Galatians. So he's not saying necessarily something different. We're talking about a different experience or different theology, but he speaks with more depth and detail in Romans and then also at times uh, fills in some gaps. So just to conclude, and, and at least today, and open a conversation for future episodes, um, I do present the hypothesis that when Paul says the law is spiritual, that's Romans 7.14a, it is explained in part by Galatians 3.19. Let's look up that real quick. Galatians 3.19 says, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But then we have Romans 7.14b, which talks about Paul saying, But I am of the flesh sold under sin, being explained by Galatians 3.22-24, through 24, which says this, But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. So he's speaking about life under this imprisonment, and in Galatians he describes that in terms of a pedagogue. The pedagogue, uh, the law was a pedagogue, and it held a juvenile people and guided them under discipline and directed them unto the time where they would come to maturity and then receive their inheritance. And in Galatians, that promised eternal inheritance is none other than the Holy Spirit himself. So, the law then, in this scheme, is spiritual in that it originates from heaven. It guides us as a pedagogue unto the precipice, just as Moses brought the people to the Jordan River. But to cross over into the promised land, we need the man of heaven, we need a life-giving spirit, which is exactly what Christ is described as in 1 Corinthians 15. And once he enters in, he gives to us his spirit, and he brings us with him on that path of ascent so that we can offer the obedience of faith, Romans 1.5, which was the goal, or at least a, an, an objective of the law in the very first place, Romans 8.4. Now, one last thing I want to mention. There's another reason why this idea seems to fit quite well, and that goes back to Romans 7.9. Because Paul says, I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. Now, I don't know how you brothers have interpreted that in the past, and how I need to review how some of the other traditional interpreters view it, but it seems rather odd for Paul to say that he lived um, 
apart from the law. Could we could we agree on that point? <laughs> Especially when we read Philippians Amen. 3, correct? Because in Philippians 3, Paul gives his pedigree in terms of his life under the law. The only moment of time you could ever say he was apart from the law, conceivably in my mind, is possibly the first seven days of his life, right? Before he mm. was circumcised. And that mm. that itself would be kind of rather procrustean to, to say that's what he's talking about. Because... He isn't even conscious, or at least, you know, he's not having these thoughts that he's describing here. So the question is, well, what in the world is Paul talking about? Some people might say, well, Paul thought he was alive apart from the law. But Hmm. Paul himself understood he was under the law. He just thought he was righteous according to it, right? And before he was a believer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's much more natural to say when Paul is saying, I, he's not talking about his personal experience, so to speak. He's speaking about Israel in between Sinai and um, Pentecost. But when he says, I once was alive apart from the law, we can look to Galatians, right? Because if Romans 7 is an, is an expansion of Galatians 3, let's flip back to Galatians and maybe we f- can find something that would illumine what Paul is saying in Romans 7, 9. And indeed, we have exactly that. Remember Romans 7, 9, I once was alive apart from the law. What does Paul say? In Galatians chapter 3, he says, uh, flipping back um, to 17, 317, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. My point was that the nation of Israel, so to speak, was created. Now, the people of God have existed from the very beginning, but there's a particular covenantal point in time with Abraham that they're called and established. And they lived from Abraham to Moses, apart from the law, apart from the administration of the old covenant. They once were alive apart from the law. It doesn't mean they were not bound by sin, but they once were alive apart from the law. But when the law came, meaning when they received it as Sinai, Sin came alive and they died because the law, when it comes into contact with sinners, it, it, it points out that sin, it condemns them. It's not that they weren't condemned already, but now they come to realize it and sin is fired up. It increases the transgressions and then it drives them to Christ and now they have the sacrificial system to pre-enact what must be done. They must die to sin and be raised according to the Spirit and then ascend unto heaven. So, Again, I'm trying to condense like an hour or two of material here, just about five minutes, but I think that'll at least get us started and at least allow us to conclude on a on a harmonious point, connecting the role of the Spirit from Moses all the way through unto Christ. The good thing, Camden, is that your two talks you gave at the conference are going to be coming now. Yeah, yeah, they'll be public, yeah. To them, yeah. yeah. So the first time I, I heard that approach, the redemptive historical approach to Romans seven was um, from Ritterboss's uh, right. Paul, yeah, and uh, that was very helpful. Chapter three of uh, of Ritterboss's Paul book is where you might look to to kind of see an early nineteen sixties version of um, of that thesis. So very good. I appreciate that. Now, of course, there's a lot of more work, to, a lot more work to do. Um, I don't. I don't pretend to think that this is all buttoned up and down and there, there are no issues. I'm still working hard and meditating on and thinking through uh, 725. But all in all, I think, and I would compel the listeners at least, read Galatians 3, well, even read Galatians 2 through 4 and line it up with Romans, maybe Romans 5 through 8. And, and especially focus in on Romans 7, uh, four and five, or Romans seven, five and six, and if you treat that as uh, Romans five and six as kind of a table of contents for what's to come, so Romans seven five describes what Paul's going to say in seven seventeen through twenty five, and then Romans seven six describes what Paul's going to say in Romans eight. So we see life under the law. It's not necessarily speaking about whether they were regenerate or believing. It's talking about a redemptive historical era in which they're living under the administration of the Old Covenant. And the law does not afford the opportunity for them to be redeemed. It does not have the power to redeem them. And therefore, they do not have the power to do that which the law commands them to do. 
and therefore they are dead and they're imprisoned under it. But when Christ dies and is raised from the dead, he sends to us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads God's people and enables them in this newness of life to obey the law and to walk, not in the way of the old written code, but in the Spirit. And that was the whole point all along, that we would ascend the mountain of the Lord And the pathway to ascend is written out by the law, but the law is not done away with in Christ. In fact, he is the fulfillment of it, and in and through him we walk then in obedience, in righteousness. I think it's a much healthier way to view it rather than saying law bad, spirit good. When we understand that the law is good, but it can't redeem people, its function condemns people and kills people without the Spirit. But those same people having the Spirit then understand that the law is the pathway of life. Right. Yeah, and it, boy, we could go on all day with this, Camden, as you know, but Galatians 5, um, I, I think that this interpretation uh, gives a certain richness and fullness to understanding what Paul is saying in Galatians 5, uh, verses 16 uh, through 18. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right. For the flesh lusts, this is the uh, New, uh, New King James, against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Ver- that sounds very Roman 7. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's right. Um, And that just, you know, like you read that and antinomians, of course, make all sorts of hay out of verse 18. But if we understand it in the redemptive historical sense, we can't adopt an antinomian approach to the law or to the reading of verse 18 in in Galatians 5. Um, These are this is a battle of two eons, we might say, or epochs. And uh, the, 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 the realm or the sphere of the spirit versus the sphere in the realm of the flesh, mm-hmm. uh, which has practical implications for our daily lives. Um, but we have to understand this is not this is not sort of like the body against our souls or no, something no. like that, which is how it's often taken. Right. Uh, but this is a battle of two um, epochs and spheres that are in antithesis to one another. And either you're under the one or the other. Right. Because under both at the same time. Right. And just to conclude, I would say, you know, as Christians, we should love God's law. I mean, the psalmist is not uh, misguided when he says, oh, how I love your law. And and he talks about it being the pathway of life. These are good things. And we should have the approach to the law as well. But we don't save ourselves by obeying the law. Only Christ could do that. He obeyed the law for us. So it's an entirely monergistic system. Nevertheless, to throw the law out now, as an antinomian would do, would be for Christ to have saved us and give us his pathway, his directives to follow him, and then we'd toss those out. I mean, it would be like getting lost on the road of redemption. Now, again, we're not saving ourselves, but the Lord gives us the law that we would walk in Christ's steps. So if you want to climb the mountain, ascend the mountain in the way that God has provided and in the way that the Spirit enables us, how do we do that? We do what he commands. If we love the Lord, we will obey his commands. We will follow the law. It guides us. It leads us. And so this is, a, I, I think, just a much more helpful way to see what the Bible's teaching us and believe it. that's exactly what the Bible's teaching us. And I'd encourage our listeners to kind of take a look at that and, and think about these things in new ways. And, and perhaps we can all arrive at a better understanding. So we'll leave it at that and um, encourage people to check us out um, online and follow up with the conference addresses. You can do so by uh, heading over to reformedforum.org. You can also head over to our YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash reformedforum. And all of our episodes are usually all posted there, both full episodes as well as uh, clips. And the conference addresses will be online as well. And if you've got any questions or comments or feedback, you can always hit us up on the Facebook page or group. And uh, also in the comments on our online posts at reformedforum.org. We do want to thank you for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>